Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arhato Sama Sambudhasa Paru Tate Sama Matasa Duara Yesu Tuhan Tuh Pemencantu Sadhati Ok, very good <coughs> So, for this next uh, session on the karma and rebirth in early Buddhism we're going to be looking at some of the evidence so we're not going to be content just to say okay this is what the Buddha said we're going to have a look and see well is it true and there are many different kinds of evidence that we can have uh, and so we'll, we'll begin by having a look at some kinds of evidence which we find in the suttas the first kind of evidence that we find in the suttas is the uh, evidence, I guess you'd call it the evidence from authority or the evidence from personal experience. And that, of course, is the experience of the Buddha himself. Now, uh, you know, most of the people in this room probably are, uh, you know, quite committed Buddhists. And, uh, you know, we probably feel that if the Buddha said something, that, you know, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> Right? So if the Buddha says something, that's usually it's, we, we, we sort of, okay, that's, that's, we'll believe that. And I think there's good reason to do that. We know you, you shouldn't discount authority, right? I mean, the Buddha was incredibly wise, and he said so many things which are true. But he also said, you should test what I say. So let's have a look at what the Buddha actually says about um, this. And this is a, just a standard passage which we find in the suttas on the, the uh, Tevija, the threefold knowledges. And this is the uh, account of the Buddha's own enlightenment. Uh, he's talking about the night when he became in, awakened and the experiences that he had in that night. And so here's that uh, one of those standard passages. Uh, this is from uh, Majjhima Nikaya number four, the Bhairava Sutta, but actually this, this stock passage which appears in many, many places in the suttas. <clears throat> when my mind was in samadhi, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to peacefulness, I had directed it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. So with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their karma thus. These worthy beings who are ill-conducted in body, speech and mind, revilers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who are well-conducted in body, speech and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and I understood how beings pass on according to their karma. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the middle watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and, and realization arose, darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. So this is the second of the three knowledges, the Tevija, uh, and as the Buddha said, he realized this on the night of his awakening. Now, one of the things about this experience that the Buddha is talking about, and there's a number of things to remark here. First thing is that this experience is very central to his experience of awakening. Okay, so it's true that it's not the final stage of awakening, right? That's just about to come, and the Buddha realizing the end of all defilements. Okay, so it's not the final thing, but it's still mentioned very commonly and very centrally as an important part of that experience of awakening. So it's not something that we can kind of dismiss lightly from the Buddhist uh, experience. Second thing about that experience is if, if you look at how the Buddha is describing that, it always begins by talking about the clarity and purity of the mind which he has attained due to samadhi. Okay? Now this is very, very important. When, when we're looking for uh, evidence, right? we're looking for the facts, we need to polish our lens. Right? If you're looking through a microscope, make sure that the lens is clean. Right? 
You're looking through a telescope, make sure your lens is clean. If you're looking through your mind, make sure your lens is clean. And this is what is happening here. And so normally, our minds are unclean, aren't they? They're, they're confused and messy and we lose attention and so on and so forth. And we distort reality in all kinds of ways. And we should be aware of that. We're aware of all of these different ways that we can't perceive reality correctly. And one of the great examples of this is, is the... Um, uh, the video with the, um, the the basketball players and the gorilla. Has anyone seen that video? It's a classic one on perception. This one was shown by John Kabat-Zinn when, was at, when he came to, to, to Sydney a few couple of years ago, gave a talk and there was like, I don't know, two or three hundred people in the auditorium and he showed this video, right? And if you describe the video, you can't believe what actually happened, but it really is true. He shows a video. Now, the video has two teams. One team was like six people wearing white shirts and six people wearing black shirts, and they have, they're have they playing basketball. They're passing the basketball from one to the other. And the audience is instructed to count how many times the white team passes the ball, okay? So you've got to sit there and count how many times. Meanwhile, and then they show the film, short clip for a couple of minutes. Now, meanwhile, while they're showing the clip, a man in a gorilla suit walks out into the front, right in front of the cameras, beats his chest, jumps up and down, and then walks off. Okay, this is not like hidden in the background or anything like that. It's just right in the center of the camera, the man in a gorilla suit. And then they get to the end of the clip and, they, and, they, and you ask people, how many times did the white team pass the ball? And people say 12 times or 14 times or something. And then you say, and did you see the gorilla? Did you see the man in the gorilla suit? And people go, no, what man in a gorilla suit? Right? And it's just unbelievable. I knew about, I've been told about this beforehand, right? So I knew it. And it's just, what do you mean? Of course, there's a guy in a gorilla suit who's coming up and jumping up and down in front of the camera. And seriously, in a room of 300 people, 250 of them are saying, what man in a gorilla suit? Right? And then they show the clip again, and everyone's going, no, oh, that's incredible. He wasn't there before. <laughs> It's really astonishing. You see how much that our perception is being distorted, right? So this is what the Buddha is saying here when he's talking about samadhi. Samadhi is the ultimate way of clarifying your perception. Yeah? All of that is gone, right? Your mind sees with unbelievable clarity yeah? exactly what is happening. And so the, 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 the knowledge and the wisdom that arises from that experience is so profound and so reliable. So this is why that experience, uh, the, the, the nature of the experience is so important uh, in, in assessing this. So this is the Buddha's uh, you know, main teaching and main sort of grounds for this idea of karma and rebirth is his own experience. Now, uh, but let's have a look. We won't, we won't be satisfied with that. We'll also have a look and see is there any other grounds for accepting this idea. So, uh, one of the other suttas that talks about this, and this is one of my favourite suttas, is a sutta called the Payasi Sutta, a, discuss a discussion between a monk, Kumara Kasapa, and a, a prince called Prince Payasi. And uh, the Payasi Sutta is, is quite an astonishing uh, kind of literary document uh, uh, which details the attempts of Prince Payasi to prove whether rebirth is true or not. And I'll just go through some of his uh, thought processes and ideas. And actually, Payasi is a strikingly kind of modern character. Anyway, here we go. At that time, uh, Prince Payasi uh, had this wrong view. There is no other world and no, there are no beings reborn there, uh, nor is there fruit a result of good and bad action. Okay, so a classic kind of wrong view. So then uh, Payasi went to see this monk, Kumara Kasapa, and he told him of his view, and uh, Payasi said, I will, uh, I will question you. So they then have a debate about this, and um, it goes on. So Prince Payasi has uh, explained why he came to this view. He said, I have had friends, companions, and relatives who have taken life or committed thefts and so on, uh, have been liars and had all of these, these, these ways of bad to come, the dasa akusala kamapata. Then they've got sick and they've died. When we well, were sick and they were dying, when, when I knew that they would not recover from that illness, I went to them and I said, 
Oh, look, I don't think that... Uh, uh, they said that some people say that, that people who've done bad things, when they die, they're going to be reborn in a bad destination. You've broken all these precepts. If that's true, then you're going to go to a bad destiny. So, but I trust you. So well, let's make an agreement. You know, after you've died, then, you know, you can come back and see me, and then you can uh, uh, tell me whether uh, it's true that bad people go to hell. Okay, so they say, very good, and they agree to it. But then afterwards, they don't come back and see me, and they don't send a messenger to see me. So therefore, I can prove that there's no such thing as, as a rebirth, okay? So Kumara Kasapa says, well, okay, let me ask you about this. Take the case of a man who'd caught a, a criminal red-handed and brought him up and say, this criminal had been caught in the act to inflict him whatever penalty you wish. And so they bound him with a strong cord, shaved him, his head led him to the sound of a, of a drum from street to street, and at the southern gate they, they, they should cut off his head. And so then they did those things. Now, would that criminal be able to ask permission from his executioners? Excuse me, good executioners, could you just wait before cutting off my head? I'd like to go and visit my family, um, my friend. I've got a message from my friend. I could just, if I could just go and take them, I promise I'll pop back any moment. Uh, and would the executioners let him do that, or would they just cut his head off? And so the prince says, of course, they would just cut off his head. So how much more difficult would it be after you've gone to hell? What are you going to do? Are you going to say to the, to the wardens of hell, excuse me, good wardens of hell, do you think you might just let me out of hell for a little while so I can go and visit my friends because I've got a message that I've got to take you to him? What do you think the wardens of hell are going to do? Right, so any further proof? So then next one. It's the, the opposite, right? So people who've done a good life and they should come and tell him what's happened to them when they get reborn in uh, uh, heaven. And, but then they died and they didn't come back and tell me. So that proves there's no such thing as heaven, right? So Kamara Kasapa gives him the following argument. It says to him, what if a man was plunged head right down to over his neck in a pit full of mud? And then you were to get your men and saying, okay, pull this man out of that mud. And they pulled him out. And then they brushed the, the dirt off him and they bathed him, shampooed the bodies, the man's body three times with yellow shampoo powder. And they did that. Now rub him with oil and anoint him. And so they did that. And now deck him with a costly garland and costly makeup and, 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 and uh, uh, clothes. And they did that and they gave him all of the pleasures and so on. Then, what do you think? Would this man, well bathed and anointed, shaved and dressed and clothed in clean clothes, would he then want to go and jump back into that pit of mud once again? And so Prince Piyasi said, no, of course he wouldn't. Well, exactly. Right? So once the beings have been re died from the human realm and they've gone to heaven, what do you think? They're going to come back here into this pit of mud again? Or are they just going to enjoy themselves in that uh, uh, heaven realm? It says here, in fact, that the smell of man offends the gods even a hundred miles away. Right? That's how smelly we are to the devas. <laughs> so they wouldn't come back. Okay. Uh, so then Kumar Kasa goes on to give another argument about that. He says, that actually, time moves differently in the heavenly realms. And this is a very interesting argument, and it's the first, first mention I know of anywhere where it talks about time as being relative. Okay, rather than time being absolute. He says that the time in the heaven realms moves much slower. So one uh, uh, a century here is only a day and a night in the realm of the heaven of the 33. So if the being do get reborn in that realm, then they think, you know, once they get reborn there, they'll say, oh, look, you know, now I've gone to heaven, I'll just have a look around the place and, you know, just enjoy myself for a minute and I'll go and visit my friends soon. But once they've done that, they realize, oh, a hundred years has gone past on earth. Yeah, so they can't come and see. So, and another argument, he says that, um, uh, Kamal Kasipa says, what if, if there was a man born blind who couldn't see colours, red and blue and yellow and brown, and therefore he said that these colours don't exist. Would that be right? He said, no, well, the colours exist anyway. This is a very interesting argument, you know, this relates to that kind of meditation, uh, uh, states of meditation I was talking about before. In meditation you're cleaning your eyes, right? you're seeing things which normally you couldn't see. 
And so realities are being revealed, which normally you can't see. And so blind, most of us are we're blind. We can't see those realities, and so we assume that they don't exist. So, and there's many other arguments of this kind, uh, which I, I won't uh, do go through all of them, but I'll just read one more of the kind of arguments that the prince used. He said, okay, here's another proof that there's no such thing as rebirth. He, he Take the case of, here's a man who's, who's uh, is a criminal, he's brought before me, and they, they say, you know, here's a criminal, uh, give him whatever penalty you wish, okay? Now, these were the days when they could do experiments without having to pass them through the ethics committee first, okay? So he's a prince, so he says, we'll get this criminal, we'll put him in a jar while he's still alive, we'll close the mouth of the jar, cover it over with wet leather and put a thick cement of moist clay, we'll put it into the furnace and we'll light a fire, okay? <laughs> then when they know that the man is dead, they'll bring the jar out of the fire and then they'll quickly open the mouth and look at it very closely to see if you can see his soul coming out. And we did that and we couldn't see his soul coming out, so therefore there's no such thing as life after death. So another one they did where they, uh, they did the same thing, right? except this time they weighed the jar. Okay? So you weigh the jar with the man who's alive, and then you weigh it again after it's dead. Right? And surely if his soul has left his body, then it must weigh less, right? Because your soul has gone out. Now, okay, well may you laugh, okay? Well, you weren't stuck in the jar for a start, okay? <laughs> Right? But more importantly, it's actually a pretty good experiment, you know. I mean, it's, it's based on measurement. It's actually quite a good scientific experiment. I mean, okay, leaving aside the whole killing human beings part of things, which, okay, fair enough. But, uh, you know, it's actually, you can see, he's taking a very rational and scientific approach to these things. You know, so Kumar Kassaba, you know, so well, basically, yes, you know, it's true, you, you, you know, you're taking this approach, but you're... Uh, uh, you're still going about it the wrong way. That's not how you find out about this. There's many other examples that he gives here. And that one of the nicest things about this sutta when they get to the end is Prince Payasi says to Kumara Kastapa, he says, look, actually, Bhante, just to let you know, I, I, I was actually quite convinced by your first argument, but I just brought up all those other cases because I wanted to hear what you had to say. So he actually... <laughs> The whole sort of is really just because he enjoyed having a good argument. So this is a, 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 a lovely uh, characteristic, I think, of the Indians, that they like to have a good argument for the sake of it. Anyway, so this is the Payasi Sutta. So this, what this goes to show is that this attitude of uh, like using, looking for evidence, investigating, inquiring as to what rebirth is and how it, how it works and so on, this is something that's not just a modern invention. So there were people doing that all of that, those years ago and the various different kinds of evidence and so on which have been brought forth. Now in our modern times, we have, we have new kinds of evidence and new ways of investigating which uh, weren't available beforehand. Now it's often uh, assumed, I just, I just a point that I'd like to make before going on to look at the modern evidence, it's often assumed that the idea of rebirth is somehow incompatible with modern science, okay? Now, why is that so? Well, it, that's so because, again, it's often assumed that, uh, from a science point of view, that our consciousness is dependent on our physical body. That is, uh, they often say that consciousness is an emergent phenomenon from the brain. Right? So if you have brains, you organize them to a sufficiently sophisticated level, and then consciousness kind of pops out on top. So this idea that consciousness is dependent on the body, not the other way around. So therefore, when your body dies, your brain doesn't work anymore, therefore consciousness can't work anymore. Right? So this idea that there's a one-way causality from the brain to consciousness. Now, right? So that view is not a scientific view, okay? And, uh, and, and I'm sorry, anyone who thinks that it is, it just isn't, right? That view is entirely, it's a philosophical view, okay? It's a theory. Science hasn't proven that view at all. Science has got no idea what consciousness is, right? Let alone an ability to make a, a, a hard and fast statements about consciousness being produced from a brain or something like that. So any statements that we're making about consciousness and the relationship of consciousness to the body, these are philosophical claims. They're not scientific claims. No one's proved them at all. 
So all you can prove is that there's some kind of relation between a brain and consciousness, but you can, no, no one's proven that the, the, the mind is, is dependent on consciousness, uh, on the brain, in that way. So actually, from a scientific point of view, there's no compelling reason to think that the, the, the mind can't exist without consciousness. The question is whether there's any evidence for that, right? And I think that there is evidence for, for it, and moreover, I think that there is strong evidence for it. I think there is, in fact, better evidence for rebirth than there is for something like, say, string theory, right? I mean, string theory is a very common theory in physics which has been taught for 30 years and has been an object of intense research by thousands of physicists all around the world, and there's basically no evidence for it at all. Right? But it's, it's theoretically convenient, right? It explains a bunch of things, but it's never been really kind of proven. There's no, there's no actual evidence for, for string theory, and yet somehow that's an uh, uh, a acceptable scientific point of view. Uh, similarly with things like multiple universes, right? This is a, a, an acceptable interpretation of quantum theory, right? That every time that a particle um, uh, 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 can, can collapse as either one state or another, that it produces two universes, so that we're producing billions and billions and trillions of, of new universes every second, right? And these multiple universes have been created. That's an acceptable scientific view, okay? But the idea of rebirth somehow isn't. I think this is nonsense. I think there's actually a lot of good uh, evidence for rebirth. I think that it uh, fits firmly within ordinary scientific principles like conservation of energy, okay? Conservation that, that energy is transformed. Consciousness is kind of energy. It's transformed. And so I don't think we need to be... Um, uh, uh, we don't need to be kind of ashamed or apologetic about the idea of rebirth. It's a, a perfectly scientific theory and there's a lot of good evidence for it. So what kinds of evidence do we have? Well, one kind of evidence that we have is the idea of, of uh, near-death experiences. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this idea. Uh, and people who uh, uh, pass away, they come to a time where they die or they're close to death and they have different kinds of experiences. A classic one, they'll kind of come out of their body and they'll see a white light and then move towards that white light and then experience uh, bliss and happiness. They might see their, their own body or people around their body or they might then have a vision where they might see their past relatives and so on, and then they make a choice. They're told that they can either continue or they can come back. And so, of course, the ones that we know of are the ones who've come back, and they come back and they re-enter their body. And these experiences are not uncommon, uh, and they uh, are often very life-changing and very profound experiences for people. One of the problems with near-death experiences, though, is that uh, it's sometimes it's difficult to show that it's not just a purely subjective experience, right? So how do you how do you prove that it's uh, that there's actually that that, that 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 the consciousness has gone on after the death of the brain? Now there are some experiments and some examples where it does seem to show uh, that the, these some of these experiences have happened uh, after the brain is already dead, uh, and if that's the case, then it conclusively proves that there must be consciousness happening after the brain is dead. Uh, but that's not easy to prove, it's not easy to establish, because it's not easy to show exactly when the brain dies and when all these experiences happen. So near-death experiences, I think, are good evidence for rebirth, but I don't think that they're conclusive, and I don't think that they would really persuade uh, someone who was a, a, a die-hard skeptical, a die-hard skeptic. The, the, but I think the most um, persuasive evidence for rebirth is the, the uh, uh, research which has been done over the past several decades by Professor Ian Stevenson and more recently by his student, uh, Dr. Jim Tucker. And uh, Professor Stevenson uh, was a biologist who got interested in this idea of, uh, you know, he's a very promising young biologist who got interested in this concept of rebirth and reincarnation and decided and devoted his life's work to researching it. And it's quite an extraordinary thing to do because, well, basically it's kind of professional suicide, right, apart from anything else, right, to be, be supposedly a biologist and then tell your, your, uh, your mates that you're re researching reincarnation. They look at you a bit funny and sort of shuffle over to the other side of the room. Uh, so, but he did it and he stuck with it and he, he was an extremely careful researcher, very methodical, uh, very cautious, 
and very uh, systematic in how he went about things. So uh, when we were um, uh, doing some research on this topic, uh, Ajahn Brahmali and myself had the uh, great fortune to interview Jim Tucker, who was a Professor Stevenson's student. Professor Stevenson died a few years ago, so he's now proven that rebirth exists or has not proven it, but he hasn't come back to tell us about it. So, uh, But we got to a chance to speak at some length with his student, Jim Tucker, and uh, to discuss some of the issues associated with this. So what I might do now is just read some of the uh, excerpts. I have a transcript of that uh, interview, and uh, I might just read some of the excerpts about uh, what uh, Jim Tucker talked about and... Um, uh, some of the cases. Okay, so uh, here's one example, which is a, uh, a typical example of the kind of case that uh, uh, Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker have researched. This one's concerning a, uh, it was in the book called Return to Life, uh, one of Jim Tucker's recent books, um, 2013. Uh, and by the way, if in case you, if you're familiar at all with Ian Stevenson's work, uh, you can find they've got a lot of information on the web. Uh, so if you just Google it, you can go to their, their website and they've got a lot of great stuff there. Ian Stevenson published uh, a large set of volumes of research and so on. Now, Ian Stevenson's work tended to be very uh, erudite and very kind of dry and, and uh, fact-based. Uh, and But Jim Tucker's work is a bit more accessible, so if you've found Ian Stevenson's work to be a bit dry in the past, then uh, have a look for some of Jim Tucker's books, and he's, he's, um, it gives a bit more of a, a personal touch to things, which makes them very nice and readable. So here he is talking about uh, this case of James Leininger. Uh, so, concerns a little boy, James Leininger, growing up in Louisiana uh, with Christian parents. Now, around the time of his second birthday, he started having terrible nightmares of a plane crash. He'd be kicking his legs up in the air and screaming, airplane, crash on fire, little man can't get out. And these were going on multiple times a week, and it was very traumatic for the parents to see their little toddler going through this. Then, during the day, he'd take his toy airplanes and say, airplane, crash on fire, and just slam them into the coffee table over and over again. It looked like a child had been traumatized, really. Then he started talking about these dreams while he was awake, saying they were from a past life, and that he'd been a pilot who'd been shot down by the Japanese during World War II. Right, so remember, this is from his, about his second birthday that he started talking about these things. This is very typical in these cases, that people start talking about them, maybe second birthday and so on. Usually by the time they're seven or so, they usually forget. So uh, he'd been a pilot shot down by the Japanese during World War II. He named the kind of plane that he'd flown a kind of plane called a Corsair. Eventually he said he'd flown off a boat. His parents asked for the name of the boat and he said Natoma. It's quite strange. For most Americans, if we were asked the name of a US aircraft carrier, you wouldn't guess something like Natoma, right? It doesn't even seem like an English word, but that's what he said. Then they always asked him what his name was, and he would always say, me or James. They didn't make anything of it at the time. So, so remember, there's this, this uh, kid. But then one day they asked him who else was there, and he said, Jack, Jack Larson. Then when he was two and a half, his dad got a book about Iwo Jima, which was a famous battle during World War II. He'd got it to give to his own father, first of all. While he was looking through it one Saturday morning, James came and sat in his lap, and they got to a picture of Iwo Jima Island, which has a very specific volcano. James pointed at it and said that's where his plane was shot down. And this really floored his father. Before that point, his father had basically been trying to write this off as fantasizing, but having his two-and-a-half-year-old telling him where his plane was shot down was quite something, so he started to investigate, initially just to show that there was nothing to it. But the more he got into it, the more he learned that what James had said matched very closely to a particular pilot. It turned out that there was an aircraft carrier called the USS Natoma Bay, and it was in the Pacific during World War II. And in fact, it did take part in the Iwo Jima operation where it lost one pilot. It meant that if James was really recalling a past life, there was only one pilot whose life was being remembering, a young man from Pennsylvania, which is over a thousand miles from where James was growing up. And the young man happened to be called James Houston. So he had the first name in the past life that he did uh, in this life. When James Leininger became old enough to draw, he would draw these battle scenes with planes, and he always signed them, signed them James the Third. And he said that he was the third James. 
Well, it turned out that James Houston was James Houston Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. James Houston had in fact flown a Corsair like James Leininger mentioned, and he was shot down by the Japanese, and the way he had been shot down matched precisely the details that James Leininger gave. He said that the plane had been shot in the engine, it crashed into the water and it sank and he couldn't get out, and that's exactly how James Houston was killed. And on the day he was killed, the pilot of the plane next to his was named Jack Larson. So, so this was a case uh, where this man had died only 50 years before from another part of the country and his life and death matched exactly with what this little boy had said. So this is the kind of case which we've been talked about, and this is the kind of investigation which uh, uh, these people have done. And you know, one of the things which is very striking, this doesn't go into all of the details of this case, but uh, there's a lot of very small details which you see in this which actually match up, and it's sometimes it's those little details. I'm just trying to remember what this one was. It was about a, like an, um, it was a detail on the plane. It was a, um, like the antenna or something like that on the plane. And uh, when he, he saw a, a picture of that, uh, the, the little boy, he said, oh, it's in the wrong place. Yeah? And the dad was thinking, oh, this is kind of really strange. You know, why, why is he saying this antenna is in the wrong place? But then when they did more research and they spoke to the people who'd been in that uh, fleet, they said that, yes, on, on that James's plane, they'd actually had some problems with the antenna and they'd shifted it and put it in another place on the, on the plane. Right, so that the even those tiny little details, how how do you how would you even know that? Yeah? So, so to me, this kind of case is very very persuasive. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is one kind of case, but the other kind of case which which Ian Stevenson actually emphasised a lot, and which was perhaps even more um, convincing than just being able to verify the facts, is the cases where uh, there are actual physical and biological imprints from the past life on the body of a person in the new life, okay? And this is documented, many cases documented of this by Ian Stevenson. So I'll give you one typical case, this is off the top of my head, and I, I can't guarantee all the details, but it's something like this, that this is a case I'm calling from, uh, I think it was Palestine or Israel, something like that, and uh, there was a kid who was uh, born and he always used to talk about his other family in, the, in, the, in another village, right? And so when children talk about that, you know, say, take me to my real mummy and daddy, right? It's a bit distressing for the poor old parents, right? And so they try to ignore it for a while, try to get the kid to be quiet and so on, but after a while, they, they you know, there seemed to be something to it and they managed to locate the former family. I can't remember exactly how it was, right? But the story... Uh, which the uh, boy gave right, was the story was that in his past life he'd been uh, shot, he'd been killed, and that um, his uh, uh, he he he'd died in that former life and then be reborn here, and he could remember the details of the house and the family and so on, right? But that the interesting thing was that the boy had a birthmark on his chest, right, about like an inch round, looked like a bullet hole. Uh, as a, a mark on his chest. Where eventually, when they found the former family, or what seemed to be the former family, and he went in there and recognised everyone and knew all the places and things, and they, they got a photo, they asked the people, you know, about this story, and they said, actually, our son um, was in some kind of violence or whatever, and he was only like 18 or 19, and he was shot, he was killed. And so they asked to have a look at a photograph of his corpse, and they saw that he had a bullet hole on his chest, exactly the same place where that birthmark was, exactly the same size, exactly the same shape. Right? <laughs> How do you explain that? I mean, to me, it seems, to try, if you try to explain that in any other way, you're really reaching for straws, right? I mean, and there's not just one or two cases like this. There are many, many, many cases where these kind of things happen. Another case that was very interesting where uh, a boy was born with these marks around his wrist, like indentations with striations in the marks, okay? So it's like it was kind of pressed in and with ribbings. And he, his memory was of being tied up 
and he was like tied up and abandoned, and he died like that. Yeah? And again, they managed to investigate, and they found that there was an actual, you know, a life that corresponded to that. And these kids had been abducted. I can't remember the story. Somehow they'd been abducted and, and tied up until they died with their hands bound with these ropes. And you had this very, you looked at it, it looked exactly like rope marks on this little boy's hands. Yeah? And that was just his birthmark. And so there, there are so many cases that are like this. <coughs> So these, these uh, cases of Ian Stevenson and, and more lately Jim Tucker, uh, there are thousands of cases. And uh, to me, this, this constitutes a very, very strong body of evidence in favor of rebirth. I can't see that there's any other way of explaining it. Right? And to me, it, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've read what different skeptics have said and so on. And, and to me, they just seem like they, A, haven't read the material very well, and B, that they are just you know, so dogmatically committed to this idea that there's no rebirth that they just can't, um, you know, they can't get their heads around the fact that it doesn't agree with the facts. Uh, I'll just mention one other case before finishing, and that's a case which is quite well known of the little chanting boy in Sri Lanka known as Dhammaruan. And Dhammaruan uh, is quite well known these days as a Dhamma teacher, but when he was a young boy, he used to just recite suttas and uh, this is something that actually came up when we had a, uh, a Skype conversation a couple of months ago with Bhikkhu Bodhi about this. And I was with Atan Brahmali and we were discussing with Bhikkhu Bodhi and we were talking about this case of Dhammaruan. Now, when you, when you hear that there was a little boy who was reciting Pali, then maybe you think, oh, you know, maybe he picked up some chants from around the place or, you know, maybe he learned it from his parents or something like that, okay? But if you know Pali, right, and you've heard him chanting, you know that that is complete nonsense, okay? He wasn't just doing like, you know, Bhutan Saranga Chami, Itipiso Bhagavad Arahan. He wasn't doing those things. He would sit there and recite for hours hour after hour of long, complex, obscure passages which nobody ever recites, okay? It wasn't just stuff that you picked up at the local temple. And he was chanting in a style which is completely different from what you hear in a modern uh, Sri Lankan chanting style. And yet his knowledge of Pali was just impeccable. He would go for hour after hour and never make a single mistake. Okay, it's just, in, just astonishing to listen to it. It just keeps on going on and on and on. And one of the things which is interesting when we were talking with Bhikkhu Bodhi, Bhikkhu Bodhi said that when he was listening to it, he compared the, the, the readings, okay, so the details of the Pali text with the Pali text that we have published today. And he could see that actually it was slightly different. Okay? Now this is, this is always the case when you have these ancient manuscripts, there are always minor variations from one manuscript to another, differences in spelling and so on. It doesn't affect the meaning, but it's just very slight differences in the pronunciation. And each manuscript tradition has its own quirks. And when he compared what Dhammaruan was chanting to the manuscript tradition, he found it didn't agree with the manuscripts, any of the manuscripts we had available or published today. And like when Venerable Bodhi said that, I just kind of laughed and said, you know, this is, this is what happens when you get Pali geeks together, because I did exactly the same thing and came to exactly the same conclusion. And he was reciting these hours, but he wasn't using any of the Pali texts that we have widely available today. So again, to me, this is a, another case where how do you possibly explain this uh, except, you know, to me, through, through rebirth is the only rational explanation. So I think when we see these kind of evidence, and again, we see it not just one case or two cases, but we see many, many, many cases like this, then I think that there are very good reasons to think that there is something to this idea of rebirth. Having said which, and I'll just put a word of caution here, the fact that that these evidences seem to show that there is something to the idea of rebirth does not mean that they've proven everything about the Buddhist idea of rebirth, okay? It doesn't prove, for example, that there are other realms, okay? Because most of the time these people don't recollect, they recollect being born in the human realms, okay? It doesn't also it doesn't prove that beings are reborn according to their karma, because there are some cases where People seem to be doing bad things and then they get reborn in the human realm and so on and so forth. So we can't say that all of the Buddha's teachings on karma and rebirth are confirmed by these cases, okay? What we can say is that some of the basic teachings, the most important principles, do seem to be confirmed by these, this, these evidence. Uh, and 
more investigation, more inquiry is needed to see uh, whether the other uh, aspects are, are also can be, can be proven through evidence as well. So this is just a very brief discussion of some of the evidence for the teachings on karma and rebirth. And I think that's probably enough for this session. So thanks very much once more for your attention and look forward to rejoining you for the last session, which will be to look in more detail and more depth at how these teachings on karma and rebirth fit in with the Buddha's teachings as a whole.